the thing that has to come back to the world is uh, the right, the reason we established government is to protect the right to life, liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property in order to pursue security and happiness. So with the means to acquire and possess property, that actually really needs to be more explicit in the constitution. Here we go. Welcome to a special edition of the Focusing Way podcast. I'm your host, David Battistella. We call these special editions The Way is Love. Find The Focusing Way on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our website, thefocusingway.com. Today on The Way is Love on The Focusing Way podcast, we're talking global economics. It's a big subject and we're mostly hearing about it through the sloganeering of our age. Put up your hand if you've heard the words build back better more often than you wanted to in the last two years. I know I feel I have. Perhaps even more so, we have been hearing these other three words which promise a wonderful future. The Great Reset. My guests today are Michael D. Graney and Don K. Brohan. They're the co-authors of a book called The Greater Reset, Reclaiming Personal Sovereignty Under Natural Law. Whatever exists right now, a lot of it's in this false economy that's been created that's not pegged to a currency that is um, asset tied back. to anything. Yeah, so, you know, yes. asset-backed currency is, you know, that's being talked about a lot. Gold standards, you know, is that part of starting over? But, I mean, one thing um, that came to mind, I just remembered that reading a, an article a long time ago that... They had done a research study. I was living in Toronto at the time, and they discovered that most homeless men in that city, the reason they were homeless could be sort of traced down to the fact that one month they didn't have $400. So that one month where they didn't have $400 led to them being evicted out of an apartment. Uh, they Then they became homeless. Then in that situation, they had no access back into a system. But do I, I'm not sure people fully understand that it just comes down to, you know, sometimes the simplicity of a, a small act of like three or four hundred dollars that that time that buys the person the time to sort of start to move in a direction. Now, one could argue that it's inevitable that person's going to end up uh, like that. But in the systems you're talking about, um it seems that obviously you have to consider it from every point of view and the book does that but the book looks at it from you know the point of view of government of social justice of uh you know every conceivable angle we can look at this from a historical perspective as well and what brought us here um but i guess i want to go to virtue here and uh just talk about that how that return of virtue kind of has to be also a cornerstone of the, of anything we do going forward. Yeah. Well, as Fulton Sheen pointed out, and as Mother Teresa of Calcutta was working for, until you take care of people's material needs, you're not going to get very far talking about virtue. I, I remember an old Peanuts cartoon where Snoopy was sitting on the sidewalk shivering in the cold, and two of the girls say, oh, he looks poor and miserable. Let's go and do something. So they go up and say, be of good cheer, Snoopy. And the other one says, yes, be of good cheer. And then they walk off and he's sitting there with a big question mark over his head, still shivering. Right. That's why, even though, you know, we talk about shifting to an ownership system from a wage system and putting all these new ideas in place. And we've been accused at times of saying, oh, you're going to abolish welfare. You're going to abolish wages. I said, no, we're not. We're not even thinking of it. In fact, we realize that a lot of what people in the Great Reset are talking about may be necessary expedience in the short term. We have to keep people alive. Suppose someone in Toronto is going to be evicted from his apartment because he can't come up with $400 right away. There should be assistance for somebody like that until he can get back on his feet. But that's not a solution. Hmm. That's assistance. Yeah. This is why you talk about a three-stage process that we're talking about. First, take care of people's immediate needs. 
if I were talking to Zelensky right now, I'd agree with him. First, stop the war. Then we'll talk about rebuilding. Yeah. Or, but it, so if you want people to be virtuous, first take away their worries about, am I going to be able to eat today? So take care of their immediate needs. Then put them in the position where they can take care of their own needs through their own efforts. Then we can talk about developing more fully as a human being. It's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which Fulton Sheen actually used in his autobiography, you know, if you ever read a treasure in clay. He says, first take care of the immediate. Then work on your, you know, human development. Then get to the supernatural bit and you develop your faith-based needs, but become a good person, a virtuous person. Develop more fully as a human being with the assists given by your own efforts and society and our in a proper institutional environment, what John Paul II called structures of virtue. Our institutions should be structured in such a way not to mandate virtuous action, but to encourage it, make it the most advantageous. Because as you know, you can't coerce virtue. Yes, All you can do it, it, it you can't know. just be make a lot of money, write some checks, and then, you know, I've done my good either. There has to be a connection. There has to be, going back to human dignity, if we're going to have that human dignity, then it seems like that what I was talking about, superior, inferior systems, you say, well, I'm in a superior position. I have all this tremendous amount of wealth. Jeff Bezos could cut a check for $300 million to somebody tomorrow if he wanted to, just, you know, just saying. But how does that connect to connect to anything that is that is that enough well no it's not enough and in fact if you know about moses maimonides the medieval jewish philosopher he gave eight orders of charity just giving somebody money is the lowest form of charity the highest form of charity is giving somebody a loan to set them up in business so that they can help other people hmm. yes, so I what think- we're talking about is Let's make help people become, you know, de- independent through their own efforts. That way they can develop more fully as humans and help other people, not just become standing there with their hands out forever. Right. And I think also, as Mike's saying, the, the need, if you're talking about human dignity, as long as you're dependent on anyone else, you can't become a full adult. You cannot become an emancipated citizen and participating citizen. So it's when we talk about becoming self-sufficient through your own efforts, it's not, and now we're talking about economic needs, um, that it's not sufficient to only have your labor being the means for becoming self-sufficient. Now, increasingly, we're gonna need people are going to need to be able to have a source of income from their ownership of capital instruments that, and as Mike said earlier, the notion of property and private property, as it relates to each human person is the right of the owner to the full stream of fruits of what is created by what they own. It is also the right of the owner to control what that person owns. So in a corporation, for example, your your, uh, income, what you should be receiving is the full stream of dividends that the overall operation creates that you know your definable share. You should be getting the full stream of that income. Now, how the corporation gets the money to expand, that's that's a question we can also answer. But the owner, under private property, which has been Uh, not only distorted, it's been dismantled in terms of ownership in corporate shares. That owner, each shareholder must have this right, and it has has to be restored. The other is that each shareholder must be able to exercise control based on their proportion of ownership. In other words, what they're voting uh, is, is in, in terms of a private property concept, it's tied to your, uh, the stake that you could lose what you own. Now, you have other organizations that may decide, well, we'll pay out full dividends, but we believe in sort of an equal vote on how the organization and many cooperatives, that's basically how they're set up. And if the people in that company want to organize, you know, they voluntarily, they come in and they organize themselves that way, 
that's fine. But we have to, as a society, get back to this commitment to private property rights. But now, as Mike said, this is not something that only a few should have, those in a superior position. Every person from the day they're born must be able to connect now to this idea of private property in income producing assets. So when you talk about virtue here, it made me think, mm-hmm. um, is, in order for a money system to operate, in order for a society to operate, you have to have trust. And trust is gonna require honesty on the part of all the individuals involved and the notion of keeping promises, okay? Making good on your promises and that's contracts are only as good as you know that they're gonna be fulfilled. So you have the obligation on the part of the individual to be honest, to be fair to other people, um, not to harm them, not to use their property to harm them. Uh, But you also have to have within the institutions, the same quality of, you know, if, if we create something like money and we say, okay, it's, we're gonna pump out so many dollars per year, the central bank or federal reserve will create $3 trillion because we know that's about how much growth we need. Uh, what's behind it? Well, you know, the government, it's our you know good faith of the government and its ability to tax. Okay, so, all right. So all these dollar bills are basically representing the government's ability to tax. Hopefully, if it's going to repay its obligations, it's going to repay the tax. It means we got to pay, the citizens will pay for it. Okay, well, then if you have this problem that you just, okay, oh, we need, the government needs, you know, maybe a trillion more to fund military, you know, the needs of the military or whatever else, social programs, we'll just print up another trillion dollars. Okay, so what now is our, what is that money worth now? You know, you've got more dollars chasing you know, if you're good, I guess, he, and you're going to have inflation. I would ask the question there is if you went yeah. to the people every time and said, we're going to need to tax you more because we want to get into a war. And then then I would like to see how much money the people would donate to have the, to finance that war rather than hand it over into this monolithic system that makes all of these decisions for your safety, for your right as an individual in that society. And that's where we get into a question of sovereignty, where every person has to be sovereign. But once you've signed up to that society, you're now giving over that sovereignty to perhaps agree to that society, participate in uh, uh, unjust things that, you know, are protecting you in some way. And, you know, the more we see these systems unfold before our eyes, the the more uh, we start to question uh, to some degree the legitimacy of why they're being created, often they're being created for financial reasons. So uh, war is another economy, right? So I guess, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but uh, I just wanted to sort of insert that into the equation. That You know, that's a great question, though. And I mean, that's where all these ideas, we're just touching on the surface. I and know. there are many <laughs> issues that... You know, we'll never stop d- debating and discussing. So th- th- we're we're not saying this is oh we've got it right here. Here's the solution. Right. No more. The end. No, you raised a good question, which we won't get into today because I know we could spend a couple hours back and forth. But I would say this: if we had a system that would reduce the likelihood of war, which is often connected to economics, okay, and it's waged between nation states, you know, individuals don't declare war on other countries. So if we have a system that is not only just within our own nation, but extends to every person in the world and they have to develop their own systems. But if they go back to the, these universal principles and they understand the, the, the importance of virtue, both at the individual level, but within our social systems, That if we understand that and if each person in the world knows that they have equal access to the means to become economically independent and self-sufficient so that it's not a matter of, oh, my God, $400, I can't pay this bill, I'm on the street. But every year of your life, you're part of this process of 
growth and sustainable growth. I think as people get um, better educated, they'll they'll start to question: Do I need these trinkets? Do I need these things? What what could I do with an income if money were no object? What would I do with my life? So that's an important question we should ask. If we can avoid war, because it's it's it doesn't make any sense, and and everyone you know, no one needs to. You know that. Well, first of all, governments and nations are going to have a much harder time dragging their citizens into wars. If the citizens are doing well, they're prosperous, they're interacting well with each other. So, those sorts of harmful um, circumstances, with the right principles, and this is both on the moral level and you know in terms of reason, in terms of economics in terms of you know how we develop our our tools these are things which if we and, and this is the idea of the greater reset is we've never had a world yet which was able globally to function with those universal principles we have the means now mm. so when we say that we're saying go back to the universal principles what we have are new tools we have these wonderful inventions including corporations as a tool for production but it's if they're used according to the wrong principles, they lead to the kind of disaster that's now we're staring yeah. right into the face. Yeah, and you know, I just you're both in the United States, and um, you know, uh, when you write the Economic Democracy Act, you're doing it um, considering the U.S. laws and the U.S. taxation codes and those examples. But what example do you feel? Um, the United States Constitution gives as a as a blueprint. It's a relatively new country. It's still a, a relatively new idea. What example does the Constitution of the United States give, or what foundation can it have in building a new system? Well, it must be an awfully good one because Pope Pius IX used the U.S. Constitution as the blueprint for the for his Constitution for the Papal States. But the it's it's found in the preamble to the U.S. Constitution. We, the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice. And right there, what you have is a statement concerning the dignity of every single human person. Now, admittedly, there were flaws in that Constitution. It recognized slavery. There are a few other things. It does. It did not explicitly mention private property as a natural right. Uh, but this is what the process of amendment is for. The basic document itself, which was framed by the Declaration of Independence, which was itself kind of plagiarized from the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which identified life, liberty, and private property as the fundamental rights for every single human person. Now, how you phrase that and how you implement it within a particular country or society, that's for the people themselves to work out. But the basic principles have to be recognized. Right. And Mike, uh, one thing, he mentioned the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which was written by George Mason. And in that, and this is the thing that has to come back to the world, is uh, the right, the reason we establish government is to protect the right to life, liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property in order to pursue mm -hmm. security and happiness. So with the means to acquire and possess property, that actually really needs to be more explicit in the constitution, not only of this country, but every, every country. And we have the means to do that, which will protect private property rights, which will ensure that access to private property is universally accessible. So, you know, I think your, your questions are <laughs> really mind stretching, but- um, I mean, uh, private property is so important that you find it in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United yeah. Nations, well, which- and the, and the Catholic Church advocates, advocates ownership of private property. So all these massive institutions yeah. which are already in place already advocate all of these things as much as that's been distorted or bent into other ideas over the years um, 
Sorry, yeah, go ahead, Fulton, Michael. Yeah. yeah, as Fulton Sheen pointed out, private property is the cornerstone of Catholic social teaching. And if you know your history, Jesus himself advocated it. If you're familiar with the parable of the talents, most people don't understand that because they don't understand the specific thing that Jesus was talking about. See, according to Aristotle, to back up a few more centuries, there were nominally free people who did not own capital. He considered masterless slaves because they didn't have the proper control over their own life to become more virtuous. How do, how do you become virtuous if you don't have property to protect your life and liberty and exercise your rights? Well, the Romans had an institution they called a peculium. And the Gospels, modern translations sometimes obscure this because they'll say servants or employees. No, the master called in three slaves, people without rights, without virtue. They were owned things. And he assigns them a chunk of property and goes on a journey. Well, this was a Roman custom. A master would pick what he considered worthy slaves and say, you know, that person needs to be trained for freedom. So what's the best way to train someone to become free and adult? Assign them some property to manage. And this would train them to be full adults. And when they prove themselves, they become free and sometimes the the, ma the former master would give them the grant of the property that he had, in a sense, lent them. This was why the bad slave in the parable of the talents is kicked out, because here the master gave him this enormous fortune, and he went and buried it in the ground. Now, of course, the obvious meaning of the parable of the talents is use the talents that God, it's a, it's a complete coincidence that talent and talent mean. Yeah. But use what God gave you to, you know, to develop more fully as a human being. But he said it within the context of a specific legal program that the Romans had, whereby people could become actual free adults and even quite wealthy. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes to the whole idea of the energy of money and the, the reason that it needs to be moved around because it creates for everybody. And when you take that money and bury it in the ground or you take it and... Uh, keep it um in in a form of greed it's not serving anyone or anything but but that person that's why possibly another reason that slave was punished for burying yeah. that money in the ground although that slave thought he was doing the master a great service by protecting his wealth in that way which was just another goes back to the initial part of our conversation which is wrong thinking everywhere like uh uh, and so this whole idea that we have to reshape our thinking on this. And um, it is important to look back at this thinking. But I just want to close it out because we are having a wonderful conversation. But um, I just wanted to sort of come in with this sort of closing idea or these thoughts of like, um, just where where do you feel with everything you've looked at? What mo What moves your heart in these things? What What are the... What are the key things that you want people to take away so that they can be moved in their intellect, in their heart, and in their lives to move toward this kind of new thinking of a, of a more virtuous and, and putting sort of human dignity at the front of economics? Well, if I were to, if you were to ask me that, which you just did, of course, I would have to close with, uh, it's, we didn't quote it in the book, but it, Father Faree in 1948 wrote a pamphlet, which was a condensation of his doctoral thesis, The Act of Social Justice. It's, a, it's called Introduction to Social Justice. It's available free on the CESJ website. And at the very end of it, let's see, I, I think I, yeah, I did. I got it right here. Uh, he goes in to say, you know, we're faced with enormous problems, but one of the things that the act of social justice teaches us is that they're not insolvable. We can solve them using the techniques of social justice. And he says, uh, he, firstly, then he says, all these problems that exist in the world today, they, they may seem bad, but he says, when all this is admitted, there is still something tremendously new and tremendously important in this work of Pope Pius XI. The power that we now have to change any institution of life the grip that we have on the social order as a whole, it was always there, 
but we did not know how to use it and we did not but we did not know it and we did not know how to use it now we know that is the difference so if the you take one message from the greater reset or from the just third way of economic personalism or anything of the work of CESJ is that we don't have to just sit here and accept what is there is hope we can get organized we can change it we can make a better world and a better life we can as buckminster fuller said make the world work for everybody mm-hmm. Mike said it beautifully, and frankly, I really can't add more to that. <laughs> so it is hope. That, and really, I think that is the big message to people, that there is something that's universal. And through those universals and the dignity that we were given, we can re- recreate the world in the way that God intended. The book is The Greater Reset, Reclaiming Personal Sovereignty Under Natural Law. Hey, if you made it this far, thanks for listening. Tune in on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on our YouTube channel. Like and subscribe. Join our mailing list at thefocusingway.com.